everybody. This is Joy Halstead, and thank you for joining us on Soapbox. Um, I have a really uh, different type of subject to talk about tonight and a really wonderful cause, and I think you'll find it very interesting, and, and hopefully it'll spark your interest to maybe act on doing something with this and finding out more. Um, but before I introduce my guest and tell you what our subject is, um, I would like to mention our underwriters. Uh, this is uh, Pieces Pizza by The Slice, including low-fat, vegan, gluten-free options, as well as a fine dining experience with selection of beer, wine, and soft drinks. We thank them for supplying pizza for the crew. They're located at 21st Street near Capitol Avenue in Sacramento. Their phone number is 916-441-1949. And also, uh, the Humor Times, it bills itself as the world's funniest news source. The monthly political humor magazine is available worldwide by subscription in print or digital format. Subscription info along with cartoons, funny fake news, videos, and more info can be found at humortimes.com. We'd love to hear from you uh, on our Facebook page. It is facebook.com, Soapbox Sacramento. And also we have a YouTube channel. Um, please watch us there as well. You can catch up on all the shows. Uh, Soapbox Sacramento. So tonight, I have a, a guest here that's um, really putting herself on the line, and she, she walks the walk, and um, her name, <laughs> sorry, I'm totally blowing my mind here, it's Farah Shields, and she is the board member of Sacramento Peace Action, and she is part of the steering committee of the Sacramento Regional Coalition for Palestine Rights. And she's here tonight to talk about, it's called a Freedom Flotilla Coalition. And this happens to be about a woman's boat to Gaza in the fall. And um, I'd like you to go ahead and you know tell us what that's all about. Sure. <clears throat> so the Freedom Flotilla Coalition has been sending boats to Gaza since um, about 2005. Um, they sailed the first five missions to Gaza successfully, bringing um, supplies and um, hope to the people. Um, as you may have heard, Gaza has been under siege for 50 plus years. Um, they're in dire, dire conditions. Um, so sailing these boats to Gaza is a way for the Freedom Flotilla Coalition to send a message to Israel saying we do not recognize your illegal blockade and also to let the besieged population of Gaza know that the international community has not turned their backs on them. That's great. So the uh, boat that we'll be sailing this year is made up of all female activists and all, an all female crew. And it was inspired actually by um, Mother's Day, uh, where the first Mother's Day, um, women came out to speak against the war. They were anti-war activists. So, <clears throat> being inspired by Mother's Day, they created the women's boat to Gaza. And then, do they, they carry types of supplies for, for the people? They are. They, they carry things um, such as uh, parts for dialysis machines. A lot of um, the children um, and adults have suffer from cancer and really need dialysis. Um, this is due to a lot of the chemicals that Israel sprays them with in, in tear gas forms such as white phosphorus. It causes various forms of cancers and their dialysis machines are pretty much unusable because they are unable to get the replacement parts or get new machines. So that's just one of the many medical equipments they're bringing. Another is hearing aids for children. Um, due to the loud sonic blasts that happen um, in Gaza, a lot of children have lost hearing. Um, and so hearing aids is another thing. Um, seeds for planting, um, water filtration methods. Um, since 90% of the water in Gaza is undrinkable, um, being able to filter the water is, is something that's um, really needed for the survival. And I was, I had um, come across uh, aquaponics that 
they, they were saying that they use them there to grow food on the top of the buildings because they don't have very much land. Right. So that's pretty, I thought that was pretty interesting. I mean, you have, what else can you do? And luckily they, they have the, the knowledge and the ability to do that. So helps a little bit, but it does. Um, we as Americans, we have no idea what it's like to live like that in a war zone. Oh, for, yes. for so many years and, and just all the all the aspects of it. The United Nations has um, c made a statement saying that Gaza will be unlivable by 2020, completely uninhabitable. The, the few agricultural land they do have is restricted by Israeli military and um, fisher boats are not allowed to go out beyond three nautical miles even though the UN resolution gave them 400 nautical miles. And so, was it last year that you were part of the um, Olive Harvest delegation? Yes, I went with Code Pink um, to w the West Bank in Palestine and um, picked olives, which was probably one of the best experiences. Yeah, I, I remember seeing your pictures on Facebook and it just looked like you were having the best time of your life. It was amazing. Um, you, I, I read a lot and do a lot of research about what is going on in Gaza and the West Bank and with the Israeli military, but what they don't tell you is how beautiful the culture and the people is and, and the land itself is just gorgeous. And when you see the people's connection to the land, you understand that much more why they, they're not going to leave. This right. is their home, and the trees that I had my hands in are hundreds and hundreds of years old and were their mothers and their grandmothers and their great-grandmothers, and it's as much a part of their family as their children. Yeah. And um, to, to see them uprooted um, during uh, the home demolitions and land confiscation is, is, breaks their heart just as much as seeing oh, yeah. you know, a member of their family die. Yeah, I um, had watched the movie uh, Five Broken Cameras, and it really opened up my eyes to what was going on there. And I mean, it, it was extremely sad to watch and how other human beings can treat people. Uh, it's unimaginable that they could be that just uh, monstrous. Yeah, and for me, it was really an eye-opening experience in that born and raised in the United States. Um, I'm a, a Middle Eastern woman, but I have never experienced that level of racism before in my life as being treated as the other immediately walking into Israel. Um, the first thing they asked me was, what is your father's name? Wanting to get at the root of wh what my heritage is. Mm -hmm. They didn't care that I was there as, as a peaceful activists that I never committed a crime. You know, I, I was only there to be of use and of service. Um, they interrogated me for six hours, insisted that I was doing something wrong, wanted to know everything about my family members. Um, and then at hour six, they walked out with my visa. And um, I assume that's because I had an Israeli contact that vouched for me mm. to, to get me in. And, um, and then from there, it was, it was just, you could feel it. You could feel the, the racism and the oppression. And then going from one side of the wall to the other side of the wall was, I can't even tell you, it was surreal. You know, you go in from this westernized, paved roads, beautiful, you know, streets, public works, to a third world country where they have no water because all their water is confiscated. Um, they have no public works, so you smell the burnt trash, you know, it's, it's, um, it was such a stark contrast and it was a very eye-opening experience for me. I think, yeah, I can only imagine how just the way our culture is and the, to be a part of something like that, how it just, the differences can be huge. Yeah. Um, and uh, how did you like um, going with Code Pink? Uh, Code Pink to me is a warrior group of activist women, so yeah. I felt really fortunate that I was able to go with them. Um, they were really knowledgeable and had been to Palestine many times, um, so I, w I was pretty assured that no harm would come to us. Mm -hmm. um, and they, 
they toured us around and showed us all the beauty, but pointed out the oppression that maybe we didn't initially notice, mm -hmm. such as um, <clears throat> settlers, Jewish settlers in the West Bank um, use yellow lights um, to, on their houses. Palestinians are not allowed to use yellow lights. They can only use white lights so that even in the dark, they can point out who are the Israeli settlers and who are the Palestinians from far away. And, um, you know, it, it, that's just one of many levels of, of oppression that they used. Another um, was, it was just this extreme emotional roller coaster when I was in Sebastia in the West Bank, um, a Palestinian political prisoner had just been released from jail and from administrative detention. Administrative detention means that they can come and take you and hold you indefinitely without legal representation, charges, or trial. So he had just been released from administrative detention and they, everyone was celebrating in the streets. Mm -hmm. So we all run out there to see the celebrations mm -hmm. and you know we're cheering for him and then all of a sudden everybody just says yalla that means hurry up you know and everybody scattered and we looked around and it was israeli humvees driving through the through the town they we couldn't even celebrate they wouldn't even let them celebrate and just the sheer intimidation of seeing those flags drive up the road everybody ran and hid and it was terrifying they didn't we didn't know if they were going to take him back who else was going to be taken because um, they really give no explanation and, and don't have to. I mean, they operate with impunity to any kind of international laws. And I just, I can't understand why the United States has not really intervened or done much of anything and supports Israel, and yet this is going on, and they just turned a blind eye to it, I believe. They do. I think a lot of it has to do with the Israeli lobby. There's a very strong Israeli lobby here in the country. Um, they donate billions of dollars to the elections. Um, APAC is one of the strongest um, Israeli lobbies, and um, they really have, have bought our politicians. And um, more so than that, it, it's our media as well. The way they portray um, Israelis and Palestinians in the media is, is very one-sided and completely inaccurate. Um, they, they like to paint Palestinians as terrorists when they are um, mainly nonviolent and they are resisting an occupation that's illegal. Um, and it, it says in the Geneva Convention um, that it is of the country's right, of the people's right to resist occupation of a foreign invader. Um, Israelis in, in the West Bank, occupying the West Bank, occupying Gaza, um, is is an illegal occupation and they have the legal right to resist that and for some reason that seems to escape our Western media um, as well as things such as the administrative detention um, you know the fact that Gaza is has been under siege for the last 50 years and you know there's 1.8 million people living inside those walls and 60 percent are under the age of 18. Oh goodness that's yeah, it's, it's going to be a wasted generation there, or several, really, right. I mean, and it's just perpetuated. Um, and how do you feel, like, about, like, Hamas being there? Um, well, I, I feel um, Hamas was elected by the government in Gaza. I don't agree with violence on one side or the other. I don't agree with them shooting rockets. Um, but... I think that um, the main quoted Hamas charter, I believe it's called, has been um, dismissed by Hamas since the 80s. They have expelled that from their, um, uh, their um, mission statement, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, I haven't looked too much into, um, say, Hamas as a terrorist organization because everything I see is just that they are an elected government right. in Gaza that's a theocratical government. They, they also had Fatah, which was more secular. Mm -hmm. Fatah lost the election, and I think um, people like to use Hamas as a scapegoat into what's really going on. Um, 
And a, a lot of people say that to me. Well, what, what do you think of Hamas? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you believe in arming Hamas? I don't believe in arming Hamas, no. But I do know that Hamas is not in the West Bank. Right. You know, that's very particular to Gaza. Mm -hmm. So if Hamas is the one reason why, you know, um, Israel is so aggressive towards the Palestinians, then why are they demolishing homes? Yeah, I don't, yeah, that doesn't seem to... It, you know, really make any sense. Right. They're still building and this the has same been going on. Wall. This has been going on way before Hamas ever came into exactly. the picture. Exactly, right. And in, in, on a huge scale. Um, but, I mean, I think a lot of this, they're, they're spreading the fear because they're so afraid of ISIS coming in that they're using, you know, all these excuses to um, keep funding Israel and... Um, I've just been hearing different things like that Israel's going to be the one that keeps, you know, ISIS at bay, but who knows? I mean, it's just, it's such a political quagmire and there's so much corruption on all sides that who knows what the real truth is. Well, ISIS has actually threatened the lives of Hamas leaders many, many times because they will not join them. Mm -hmm. They refuse to. So I, I don't, I think they like to put them all in one boat to spread fear, like you said. Mm -hmm. And when people are afraid, they, um, they don't n look at the humanity of the situation. Right. They're able to kind of just push it aside to get to the bigger picture, which is probably not even the true, truest of, of what's happening, right. the truest thing that's going on there. And a lot of the funding that we give Israel is military funding, right? Um, which I, I recently found out that the um, four, three or four billion dollars that we gave them was for one military plane. That was just to build this one military plane so that it could hold enough fuel to get to Iran and back without having to refuel. Mm -hmm. The war machine is strong there, right? And it's, and I, you know, I've always said Israel does not need our money. They don't. They can use they can use our our war machines, right. but they don't. Well, why are we giving them money? I I don't understand, because they're they're not hurting, from what I've heard. No, they they're not at all. They have a very thriving economy. Um, they produce a lot of the weapons that are sold, field tested, mm -hmm. um, field meaning Gaza. Um, in a lot of these gun shows, you know, that are nationwide, you know, sold to other, you know, globally, sold to other countries. So they, they do have a lot of money. Um, that's why um, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions has, you know, taken on the cause of, called upon by Palestinian civil society. Mm -hmm. um, and they basically go after these companies that are making money on apartheid. Um, G4S is one of them, mm -hmm. and you know we had a G4S campaign here right, in Sacramento. Right. Um, another one is um, Coca-Cola, which is something very common. Uh, Keurig. Keurig. Yeah. 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 Well, um, a soda, soda stream. stream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I try to I try to look at everything I buy now because I mean you know you think everything's coming out of China, but there's actually a lot of products coming out of Israel as well, right. and um, I mean. That's the least we can do is not, you know, keep giving them money to hurt people. Exactly. If our governments will not act on our behalf, then we the people have to act. Uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions was the same tools that was used to combat apartheid in South Africa and e economically isolated that country and forced them to comply with international laws. So um, activists for Palestine, we really push BDS to try to force Israel to comply with international law because in the end, what they're doing is not going to bring peace or, peace or stability to the Israelis any more than it will to the Palestinians. It is really in the best interest of both countries mm -hmm. to come to an agreement and, and stop um, the occupation and the occupation and stop the apartheid. How much of this do you believe is due to religion? Zero. Really? I believe zero of it has to do with religion. Um, there, there are many organizations, Jewish Voice for Peace is just one of them, um, that work to end the occupation of Palestinians. This is not a unanimous voice. And going to um, 
Israel and Palestine really kind of solidi solidified that for me. It's, this is a land grab. Mm -hmm. They are in it for the land. They, this is not um, protection of a Jewish state by any means. Mm -hmm. Um, this is specifically has to do with land. Most people assume that Palestinians are um, mainly Muslim. That's not true. They're Muslim, Christian, Catholic, atheist. There are all de different denominations um, that live in Palestine, and they like to make it seem very simple, very black and white, but it really isn't, you know, when it comes to religion and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and I've met even rabbis um, that are do not even recognize the state of Israel. So I I know in the end it has nothing to do with religion. It really doesn't. And it's just boy, I, I it just it's crazy when you see pictures of what's going on there and just how just large neighborhoods are just demolished. And I mean they're just they're they're killing the land. They are. And, and why do they want it? Is it just, they just want it, that's it. They, they don't care what they need to do, what they have to do to get it. It's like a pissing match to them. It's like, we're going to take it. Right. They feel, um, I think that they use the biblical history of the land as an excuse to take the land. It's, it's the land grab. It is a very strategic position on the map. Um, and I wish I had a, a map I could point it out next yeah. to Egypt and, and Iran and Jordan. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of crossing point. Um, and it's a very rich land of resources and, you know, um, and like I said, strategic position. But, um, yeah, the, it's, the, the cultures are also um, different as well, where um, Palestinians... They live with the land. Mm -hmm. They they have a very different um, perspective of land than, than Westerners do, where we tend to exploit our resources mm -hmm. and land. They have a very renewable um, culture, and um, they they're very close to their land. So, um, you know, they have their hands in the soil, and they don't treat um, species that live on the plants as insects or invasive species they they treat them as cohabitants mm -hmm. of, this, of the and it they do a very good job of it um, there's wonderful products that come out of palestine and they could actually have a more thriving economy if the borders weren't so closed off um, so israel does a lot to prevent their economy from building up any steam mm -hmm. they're just they're just in a really bad predicament and i just i hope that somewhere it can turn around before it's too late. I think it can. I definitely think it can. Um, with the rise of social media in today's age, a lot of pictures and videos are coming out. You mentioned five broken cameras. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, an award-winning documentary. Um, people are um, getting these messages. The the imagery and the stories are coming out of Palestine, where they used to be completely regulated and closed, and our opinions were basically formed from the Western media. Um, now with all of all of these tools available for us to see the truth and what's really going on um, people are coming to the movement more and realizing the truth and BDS is is getting enormous steam um, it's a lot of people um, have really been pushing for BDS in their own cities and countries um, the schools have voted to divest in California. Um, I think there's 17 universities that have voted to divest. That's and great. Yes. That's a lot. Um, Portland, Oregon has uh, initiated a do not buy list where their city has divested from companies like G4S and Caterpillar. And um, personally, I always boycott you know products that are on the list mm -hmm. and it's really not that difficult you just buy Pepsi instead of coke right you know but your little contribution makes a huge difference and um, Israel actually set up a specific division in their government to combat BDS so we know it's working and there's this um, saying by um, Gandhi that we kind of keep dear to our hearts and that's um, first they ignore us then they ridicule us then they fight us then we win. Right. So we are winning. That's great. I mean, I, I've been hearing about it more and more, um, you know, even politically here. I mean, 
I think it could be brought out more, but of course, look, who's, who, look who is up for the presidency. These people right. don't care. You know, it's like all they care about is the money and the power. Um, but it would be wonderful to see um, something turn around for them because it's way overdue and these people deserve a better life than what they've been living. I mean, oh, this, this is no life. And, you know, some of them can do okay, but what about the people that they keep losing their homes? You know, right. they bomb them out. And, and just some of the nasty things that I've seen that they do, it's just I can't even believe that they're doing that. For me, one of the worst things... Um, that they're doing right now. And actually, we've had representatives, um, Representative Benny McCollum wrote mm -hmm. a letter to Congress asking for um, envoys to go to Palestine to watch the children because they've initiated administrative de detention for the children. So they will go to the homes of these children at 2, 3 in the morning, break the door down with machine guns to everyone's heads, take their children in the middle of the night. The parents have no idea where they're taking them. They blindfold them, physically abuse them, mentally abuse them, put them in solitary confinement, and can hold them there indefinitely without charge or trial. Children. That's horrible. Um, there's hundreds of children, I think around 500, in administrative detention to date. We have like less than a minute, so what is, what's well, the last um, shout out you want to do as far as we're getting, uh, you got your website up there. Great, I would encourage everyone to visit the Freedom Flotilla website. Um, even a $5 do donation towards these boats will get one more nautical mile for them towards Gaza. And these boats are literally bringing life um, to the people in Gaza who so desperately need it. I would also like to encourage people to visit the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions movement to find out what little bit you can do in your everyday life to make the situation better. Right. Well, thank, thank you, you so for much for being here. Thanks you for having a me. Great on. job. <laughs> and hopefully, we'll hear back from you in the end of September and see what what was transpired. Yeah, I'm hoping to go to Barcelona to see that boat off. So, <laughs> I hope you make it. I hope they make it too. Me too with lots of stuff that's needed. Definitely. Um, and I want to thank our crew tonight for doing a great show as well. And we're almost out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was like, it was like, stretch, stretch. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I hope I didn't see <laughs>